Good afternoon, good morning. This is a lecture on Calvinism and its impact upon the American colonies in the uh, 16th, 17th centuries. Now, when we talked about in previous classes, we talked about Luther and his reforms and his reformation. Uh, I spent a good deal of time discussing the impact and the various facets and the nuances of Lutheran Protestant theology and how it contrasts with the, Calvin, uh, with the uh, Catholic Church. Uh, Luther, of course, dies in about 1546, and uh, he is going to uh, be one of the giants and one of the fa uh, the, four, the giants of the Reformation. But in many respects, when you talk about American history, of uh, the English colonies especially, Luther's impact is, uh, in a sense, limited, and perhaps I should re uh, turn around my lectures just a little bit and spend more time talking about the impact of John Calvin and his theologies and doctrines uh, and its impact upon people who come here. Because ultimately, when you talk about, say, the Puritans of Massachusetts, the Presbyterian Scotch-Irish, uh, and even to a certain degree the Baptist uh, dissenters and so forth, you've got a good number of churches and uh, peoples who are steeped uh, in Calvinist practice. That doesn't mean every one of them is a card-carrying, quote, 55 uh, pages of the Institutes of Christian Religion. But it does mean that they go to churches that are heavily influenced by Calvinism and its uh, tenets and doctrines. In fact, actually, I guess one of the first things you probably need to make note of is, is that uh, when you talk about Calvin and his practices and his, uh, his movement, his form of the Reformation, is, is that where is it located at? When you talk about Calvin, the name Geneva should be with your notes. Geneva, Switzerland. Geneva, it has often been said, is the... Um, oh, how shall I put it? Geneva has often been called the. Clicking here, a couple things. Geneva is the Rome of the Protestant Reformation. When we say Rome, obviously it's an allusion to the Catholic Church, and that the Catholic Church, the papacy particularly, is headquartered at Vatican, which is in the heart of the city of Rome. Well, anyways, the papacy is there, and for the Reformation, you tend to find that many, many, many dissenters, many refugees even, are going to be driven out of various countries, say like the uh, French Huguenots, are going to be driven out of France, and you're going to see others driven out of Germany, some driven out of England. Uh, many of them are dissenters in religious sense, perhaps even political, and they make their way to Geneva, Switzerland, where they can find refuge, and for that matter, some of them find instruction, whether that's meaning they go to seminary, or they go to university or get taught in a church or their kids do the same thing or their followers do the same thing. So for Geneva, Switzerland, it has a, it, it's a, it's a sizable city, but it has a large, large impact upon the larger Protestant Reformation world. Uh, in fact, one name that you might know, and you'll see it in Unto a Good Land, is the Scottish reformer, a fellow named John Knox, K-N-O-X. Uh, without me knowing for certain, I'm going to take a stab and say Knoxville, Tennessee is named for him, considering who settled that area. John Knox is one of, is going to effectively, I'll say single-handedly, that's not exactly 100% true, but John Knox is going to have a large role and a large hand to play in the conversion of Scotland into a, a, some sort of Presbyterianism uh, and so forth. Uh, and so in that sense, American history, is in, that's where you get an intro introduction into uh, uh, Scottish Presbyterianism. Anyway, so, but John Calvin himself actually is uh, kind of different from Luther. Uh, Calvin, uh, if Luther is uh, a volcanic sort of man, he's always uh, on the run, always, I say on the run, meaning working, moving, and doing, uh, and particularly he's bubbling over, getting mad, worked up, uh, attacking, uh, writing, and so forth. Uh, Luther is very outgoing, ultimately, is, the, is a, in my point. When you talk about Calvin, uh, he's not nearly as outgoing. He, it, he himself said uh, that he preferred to be uh, pr outside of a city, kind of in a cloister, reading and writing. Yet in his life, most of his life, found in Switzerland, uh, found in Geneva, he's going to spend, uh, actually he's French and he travels and flees to Geneva. But Calvin is going to end up being one of the chief Calvin's going to end up being one of the chief uh, uh, writers and thinkers, and in fact, a leader there in Geneva, Switzerland. Uh, his uh, he's not quite a one man band, and he's not a dictator, but he does have a very large influence on politics and in Geneva society that goes beyond the church. Uh, 
And so I guess in a sense, one of the things as we t unpack Calvinism, one of the things that's worth remembering is that Calvinism transcends the church. Yes, it obviously is going to have a big role in doctrine and theology. We'll get to that in a second. But Calvinism as it's, as it's taught, Calvinism as it's transmitted to other groups like the Puritans or something of that nature, Calvinism is a denomination and a, a, a belief system, a worldview that encompasses the entire person. You cannot be, in a sense, a good Calvinist without adopting not just the dogmas of its belief, but in the sense theological, but also the trappings in the work. Uh, you'll see some say, that, and, and you'll see it kind of this way applied to the Calvinist, perhaps even like a, a Catholic monk, who, by the way, the Catholics and the Calvinist, uh, the, the Reformed, you also see them described as Reformed as well. The Calvinists and the Catholics, they will butt heads and they do not like each other one iota. Uh, for the most part. Yet here is a similarity is, is that uh, it was said about the monastics and it can be said about the Calvinists as well, the say the Puritans in American context, is, is that uh, the goal and the duty of a man's life is to pray and to work. So I mean, it, 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 it encompasses far more than just going to church on Sunday and hearing some nice platitudes and sermons like this. This is a transformative idea. Uh, you are, they are concerned about idolatry, uh, the worship of idols, strictly speaking and loosely speaking. What is an idol? Is it man? Is it a not necessarily a golden calf, but uh, the idolatry of the heart? Uh, and that how it replaces true worship in the form of Jesus uh, and the Trinitarian God, which, of course, as you should know or remember, is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But those are facets of it. This is going to take care of politics, and that the church, as you should know by now, I think I've alluded to it several times, uh, the church is uh, not separate and apart. This idea of a separation of church and straight state, a strict wall, that Jefferson talks about, that is enlightenment thinking, and that is very American in a sense. There, This idea of a strict separation is not heard of and believed in all in G Geneva. Uh, Calvin would be is would roll in his grave if you were to say to him or he say to his spirit, "Oh, you know, you should you should have a separation of church and state." He's like, "No, no, no. The state and the church work together to create, in essence, a holy culture and a holy empire uh, that ultimately would spread to the far corners of the world." Uh, this is uh, very much a a life life uh, a worldview and a life uh, style uh, in in Calvinism. And so when you talk about Calvinism in that sense, it's always fair to remember that what you believe is going to uh, color not just what you preach and live in the church, but what it's going to happen is going to have an impact upon your daily life from food, from clothing, uh, to work habits and practices, uh, to the way you play. I mean, you go down the list, it is a total, in a sense, transformation. This is, in a sense, selling out giving your entirety uh, to God, giving your entire soul. It's not for uh, just a little bit of God and a lot of bit of me or just a half and half. God is my co-pilot. No, no. This is a tr total transformation. This is a giving over. And Calvin is going to promote this. Calvin himself is a workaholic. Uh, he preached sermons all the time. Uh, many of his fellow travelers will as well. They will go out and, and start churches. They will go out and, and do various and sundry things. And they will preach regularly, daily, of course, Sunday. Luther, or rather Calvin, often would pra preach four or five days a week. It's estimated he gave thousands and thousands of sermons in his life. Uh, and what's interesting about him is, is that he was a workaholic. Uh, to the day he died, he was working. And when he died, he was actually dictating, or he dictated letters and treatises and tracts and stuff like that uh, to secretaries who were sitting on either side of his bed until he could no longer talk. Uh, someone said, John, you've got to slow down. You need to take it easy. And he said, I've got to be working. I'm, God expects me to work, and so I work. And so he basically worked himself to death. Uh, he, Calvin uh, developed ulcers, uh, hemorrhoids, had bad hemorrhoids. Uh, in addition to that, he also had kidney stones. Uh, he was an afflicted man, and so perhaps uh, that, why, that may be why at times you catch Calvin having a bit of a dyspeptic uh, personality. If Luther was a major key, minor keys apply to uh, Calvin. Uh, kind of there's a, there's a heavy and at times foreboding overtone uh, to the Calvinist philosophy and doctrine. Important all the same. 
uh, but uh, kind of two different uh, things. Uh, when you talk about Luther, Luther focuses on salvation and faith and grace and such. Uh, and all those are fi found actually the Calvinist, but there's a fuller uh, development of theology. When you talk about John Calvin, his magnus opus, and it's it's he writes an amazing amount of work. If, if he could translate languages uh, quite easily, uh, the vernacular uh, is going to the Bible is going to be put into the vernacular. So he's obviously a big supporter of, of the Word of God alone. In fact, actually, the Puritans you might make a, an underscore of this in your notes. The Puritan Bible wasn't the King James. The Puritan Bible was not the Luther Bible, but the Puritan Bible was the Geneva Bible, and that's a hearkening back to their relationship and their lineage out of Calvin and his followers. But uh, Calvin actually, when he preached, uh, people would see his notes and they would be uh, written in Greek and uh, he, they wonder how he could say what he was saying while re uh, reading his notes that are in Greek because the translations for the time period didn't work until it finally dawned on some folks who were reading Calvin's uh, translations and his uh, preaching words from his preaching notes said that he was basically translating his notes from Greek uh, to or Hebrew, but especially Greek to to, uh, to uh, German or French on the fly, he was that good. Uh, he was, uh, but he was uh, a brilliant man, uh, kind of thin and and gangly, smallish almost. Uh, but anyways, compared to Luther, very different physical appearances and so forth. But when you talk about the Calvinist and their particular doctrines, there's uh, five points uh, that we'll introduce. And those five points are marked by what is known as the acronym TULIP. T-U-L-I-N-P. A tulip, just like the flower. And this is a, what you would might call a five-pointed Calvinist, and uh, most of the Puritans you're going to come across, pretty much all of them, especially in those first few years after 1620, those Calvinist Puritans who are going to show up along the coast of Massachusetts, they are five-pointed Calvinists. Uh, and there's, uh, there's, there's also groups called four-pointers. Uh, I'll explain the difference as we go through it. Uh, but as a general rule, this to one degree or another is a point of all Christians. The Calvinists go further than most uh, in point number one. The T of the tulip. The T of the tulip stands for total depravity. Total depravity. Now, total depravity is a reference to the original sin of mankind imputed to man by the sin of Adam in the garden, the sin of Eve in the garden. And also, in addition to that, it is the actual sin or the real sin beyond the original sin uh, that man creates. But the total part of the depravity, and by the way, do not mistake this with the word deprived, like you've been deprived of a lunch or you've been deprived of your truck by your parents, uh, but depraved, a wickedness, a total wickedness. Uh, a total evil, if you like, that humanity is so depraved because of sin that ma humanity, man, cannot seek God on his own. And, and it's fair to remember when we go through these sorts of things, the Calvinists are not just pulling these things, Calvin himself is not just pulling these things out of the sky. They're pulling them and they're grounding them in biblical uh, doctrine that they are gleaming and pulling. Others disagree and say the Bible says this, this, and this. But for the Calvinists, this is not pie in the sky or some sort of philosophy or theory that just shows up. They find it very clearly in the Bible. Uh, the idea of total depravity that man cannot seek God, man cannot find God on his own, man has to be drawn by God to him. And that's the total depravity. The total wickedness of man is so pervasive and so bad, uh, it basically renders man almost in a, unable uh, to do anything but sin. It's that... Uh, that all pervasive. And that may be very different from what you've been taught and will be very, very different from what you believe uh, because uh, most people today seem to not come to the idea that people are depraved or wicked, but they come to the idea that people are actually uh, either blank slates that you write upon them just as if it was a uh, dry erase board or chalkboard, or they're born good and people are just tending to get better and it'll all work out just fine. The Calvinists and Calvin, the Puritans and others like them, the Presbyterians, simply do not believe this in the 1600s. Uh, Calvin, of course, is long dead. But they don't believe that. No, they just cannot believe. They cannot see scripturally and in practice. They cannot see uh, the goodness of man or, or his tendency to become better. They just don't see that. So total depravity is point number one. Point number two is the uh, 
con uh, the practice of unconditional election. Unconditional election is, uh, uh, let's break the words down, let's start with election first. Uh, you may think of election or have to have an election is the idea uh, behind, uh, say, well, I mean, what Americans practice every two years, uh, whether it's for the presidency every four or Congress or county commissioner or county judge or governor. You have elections, uh, frankly, honestly, more often than every two years uh, in the life of a city. It's normally every year for various offices, but you have elections on a regular basis. Election, another way to say the word election is choice. Choice. And uh, what do the electorate do when they go into the ba ballot box and go into the booth to vote for Joe Smith or to vote for Mary Watkins or whomever it may be for whatever office? They are choosing a candidate. They are selecting a candidate out. That is the human practice of, of election. And in a very similar way, the election is not going to be man's selecting of God because according to total depravity he can't select God for the for mankind uh, it is God selecting whom he shall save unconditional election is, is that you can bring effectively nothing you can bring nothing to the table and say God I gave five thousand dollars to the, the victims of Harvey let me in or God I, I shoveled soup at a kitchen one time or God I I, I come from the tribe of uh, Judah or uh, I come from the white race or I come from uh, the United States or I come from Mexico or whatever you can bring nothing in an un unconditional election that is a condition to election it is God's sovereign choice God's uh, sovereign election and that God chooses whom he shall save and this election part has also can it sometimes be referred to as predestination so you'll if you ever hear people talk about Calvinists it's oftentimes this part right here they say ah predestination Oh, the Calvinists believe in predestination, that God chooses some, elects some to salvation, and he denies others as well. Uh, and that's where one of the divisions is uh, in various parts of Calvinism. But yes, they do believe uh, that, uh, that God does choose whom he shall save. Not, not man choosing God, but God choosing his men, or his, his elect. And to say it their way. And you may be thinking, well, I've, I've heard of John 3.16 in the Bible, and it says God loved the world. A Calvinist would say, yes, that's true. However, let's take a look at John 17, where Jesus is preaching, or rather praying, in the high priestly prayer in the upper room. And what you tend to see there is a very different uh, uh, understanding of where salvation would be and would be conferred upon. So uh, if, you, if you have the time or interest, uh, that would be something to look at and compare and, and contrast, because it's been controversial in Protestant circles for some time. Uh, so, by the way, as, uh, as you might say, well, how does that affect it? I've already said the Presbyterians were found, uh, also Congregationalists, which is saying the Puritans. Uh, you'll find uh, a hand, even Luther uh, dabbled a little bit with predestination. He never developed it uh, like, the, uh, like the Calvinist will. And by the way, the Calvinists take their lineage, uh, in this case, not just from the Bible, though that's fundamental, of course. They also take it from a, an early church father named Augustine of Hippo. He was uh, sometimes referred to as St. Augustine. But anyways, this idea of God's electing call. And so uh, that uh, that's there. Number t uh, three in our list. So we had total depravity, unconditional election, and number three is limited atonement. Limited atonement. And this is where you get the division between a five-pointed Calvinist, which I'm presenting to you, and a four-pointer who would dissent right here. A five-pointer would say, not only do you have unconditional election, God's choice of whom he will save, but also on top of that, you will have uh, the limited atonement. Well, how, is, how are people saved? Well, it's yes, by God's sovereign choice, but more specifically, by what action did God take in the humanity and the Christian understanding of things that saves mankind? The answer very simply is Jesus coming as the uh, Savior Messiah. He dies on the cross, resurrected on the third day, and eventually ascends into heaven. And he here, and this is the atonement that Jesus, to use a Baptist phrase, Jesus died for our sins. Now the question raised is raised by the Calvinist, and it's not an illegitimate one. 
uh, but it is worth considering. Who did Jesus die for? Did he die for the whole world or did he die for the elect? Who did he die for? And so the atonement uh, would dovetail with that, uh, con that election business in number point number two. Who did Jesus die for? The five-pointed Calvinist, uh, strictly speaking, would say uh, that Jesus died for only the elect. There's that limited in the atonement. The blood of Jesus covers only the elect. Whereas a four-pointer would say, no, Jesus died for all, uh, but only some are called an election. So, uh, so others would say an unlimited atonement, the four-pointers would. The five-point tulip type would say limited atonement. Your Puritans and most Presbyterians of the era we're discussing in 1301, they're normally some sort of five-pointer. And so this limited atonement, God saves some, but here's the second part, God doesn't save others. In fact, you could say it's double predestination. Predestination to heaven, predestination to hell. And remember, Protestants, they don't believe in purgatory, so that's not an option. So limited atonement is a very, very controversial part in this, uh, uh, this formula. The whole thing is frankly controversial. Uh, in fact, actually, just to use something more recent, uh, the Baptist Convention, the Southern Baptist Convention, which is the general convention of most of the, 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 the Baptist denomination, there are others, to be clear, uh, but uh, the, it's the largest of the Baptist conventions, they, were going, they had a controversy erupt four or five years ago over the subject of Calvinism and what it means. So, uh, and in the Baptist church over the years, churches over the years have kind of fallen into two camps. Those who are more Methodist, Arminian type, we'll get to them later in the semester, uh, or are they more Calvinistic, which has been a tradition in the Baptist church for some time. So point number four now, we had total depravity, unconditional election, limited atonement. Number four is going to be irresistible grace. Irresistible grace. Grace is the actual, in a sense, the saving work of Jesus Christ. He act, the actual act of the atonement is on the cross in the, the Passion Week and the, the days afterwards. Uh, Jesus' ministry plus the ascension, plus the resurrection and the ascension. The fact of the matter is, is that when you talk about irresistible grace or grace itself, grace is that which saves the individual. It's grace that is offered by God, grace that is offered by Jesus that a person in faith accepts. Again, hitting these main themes of the Protestant Reformation of the five solas of uh, faith alone, Christ alone, the Word of God alone, grace alone, for the glory of God alone, all five. Well, with regard to irresistible grace, uh, this uh, grace that is saving is so uh, uh, is so uh, impressive, uh, so uh, so beautiful, if you like, that no one could resist it. One of the caricatures of uh, those who are anti-Calvinist would say is, is that irresistible grace means God is going to ram down grace down your throat to the elect. That the elect, uh, some elect will be so elected, they're going to be, God's going to drag them kicking and screaming into heaven, and he's going to ram it down their throat. And that's a caricature. It's a false caricature of the Calvinist. I've read too much. It's just uh, people trying to play fast and loose. But the fact of the matter is with regard to the, uh, the Calvinist and their understanding of irresistible grace, it would be something akin to thinking about an election again. Uh, none of you who are watching this uh, have voted. It's possible that I may use this in a later date in another class, and it, it may end up showing that, uh, yeah, you, you have voted in an election. Uh, but uh, for the primary audience that it's recorded for, you haven't elected any, you haven't voted for anybody. But if you think about your parents as they've gone to booths before, in all likelihood, 99% sure on my part, is that nobody has stuck a gun to your parents' head or put a knife in their back and said, you shall choose fill-in-the-blank candidate. In all honesty, most people will go into the box and willingly, perhaps even happily, this is the human side, so it's an analogy that breaks down probably right here a little bit, but in a sense, though, you go into the ballot box, and in all things being equal, you're probably going to willingly uh, pick uh, Donald Trump or Hillary Clinton or George W. Bush or Barack Obama or some, I use those presidential candidates that you know, or future presidents, but you willingly went in there and you chose. Nobody forced you into the booth. Nobody stuck a gun or, or, or knife to your back and said, you must choose this person. You did it on your own. 
and you wanted to. And that's the irresistible grace. That the grace was so uh, so beautiful. The grace was so free. The grace was so full that uh, you, you couldn't help but go. You couldn't resist it. But you loved it. You wanted to go. It's not kicking and screaming. It's running. Uh, if you want to think of it this way, in a sense, look at the... Uh, at the words of the great, uh, almost now uh, secular hymn, seemingly, sadly, uh, of Amazing Grace. And you look at the words there and you see this movingness of it. And there's this kind of a, uh, this idea of going. So irresistible grace is point number four. So the two, total depravity, unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace. Number five, the perseverance of the saints. The perseverance of the saints. What that basically means is that uh, for the Calvinists, and even non-Calvinists too, you'll see this, is, is that they will say that, uh, in a sense, once saved, always saved. Meaning, once, you're, once you put your faith in Christ and His grace freely offered, you're always going to be in the hand of Christ. You will never be, cannot be plucked out of His hand. I'm really just quoting the Bible there. However, not all would agree with that. There is uh, the Catholic Church to this day has uh, taught for some time, uh, many, many years, thousands, it's about a thousand years, I guess, but a long time that you could lose your salvation. Some Baptist churches teach exactly that. Uh, some Assembly of God do. Uh, there's a church over on Villa Maria. It's called uh, uh, Free Will Baptist Church. Uh, I believe that's its title. But if you see the name or the word free will in it, there's generally the idea that one can forfeit or lose their salvation. Well, the answer is, in a, a question you might have, is how do you know if you're saved? Ultimately, how do you know if you're saved? Is it by uh, strolling and walking an aisle? Does that save you? Uh, no. Um, is it, what is it that makes you saved? And the answer, boiling down, down, and down, the, the Puritan or the Calvinist answer would be, you persevere unto the end. Uh, you never fall away from the church. You never. You may backslide. You may uh, even sin for a season. Sadly, uh, you may not go to church for a season. But ultimately, you will return to the church. You will uh, confess Christ as Lord and Savior, and you will live some sort of holy life. It may not be. It's not going to be a perfect life, but there will be a perseverance in Christ to the end. You will never forsake Him. You never will forswear Him. You will never fall away. So the perseverance of keeping into the church is there. Um, so that's a, a, an overview of Calvinism, and it is a good overview for what the Puritans will believe when they come. The Puritans uh, are, as the name would imply, purifiers or desire to see the Anglican Church, the Church of England, purified. What I would suggest you do, and this uh, lecture is not designed to uh, get into the deep weeds of the the religious wars of uh, England. And it is fair to say that uh, that Europe is going to be convulsed in blood. Uh, some of the most uh, horrible wars in European history were religious wars of the 1500s and 1600s. Uh, the only thing worse would be the 20th century ideology wars of Nazism and, and communism and so forth. But anyways, uh, it is worth your time and it is important to you as far as your preparation for any exam I might give during this period of time for you to read up on Henry VIII, uh, the Puritans and Cromwell, the Roundheads, uh, the, the, the strife that goes on in England because ultimately the United States will take some of its heritage from France, will take some of its heritage from Spain to be clear, uh, but it will take most of its heritage governmentally, its outlook, its cultural heritage, its political heritage uh, from England and the impact upon religion and particularly the Calvinist versus the Anglican, Anglican fighting is going to be quite quite substantial. So uh, that ought to get us set up and allow us to uh, move to the next step which is to bring these Puritans who are Calvinists who, who absorb the whole worldview to bring them across the ocean in the early 1600s and set them up in Massachusetts and New Hampshire and Connecticut and so they can establish their holy hill their city upon a hill. So, uh, thank you, and uh, that is the end of this lecture.